Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. So, yeah, it's, it's a pleasure to present this Friday on a short notice. We accepted to present this presentation last Friday, basically. And then I asked Gordon and Francisco Pancho that actually, guys, we're going to present on machine learning. So, uh, I think just quick intro about advanced process prediction and control group. Uh, we uh, basically started developing this group two years ago, uh, followed from the strong cognition group and expertise that we have in the JKMRC. And we thought that actually it's a time to add more capability to cognition uh, expertise that we have. Uh, so we basically developed this group called Advanced Process Prediction and Control, which is uh, always control was the strength of JK. So we started uh, developing those capability around using our models for process prediction and control. And for today, I think uh, there has been lots of discussion around machine learning, AI, and use of uh, uh, these techniques and tools for linear processing, especially in uh, process control. Uh, and actually what happened was uh, earlier this week on Monday, actually, I was invited to give a uh, talk about application of AI and machine learning linear processing for a group that was related to geology and mining. I, I can't remember exactly the name of the group we cut it. It's really the Institute of Geology. Yes. Yeah. So I think it was very interesting for me to present in there. And, and, and then I thought actually for Friday that we, yeah, we're supposed to do is a good uh, thing to do an extension of that presentation and give you a talk today. So uh, actually, most of the work has been done by Gordon and uh, Pancho. Uh, and they're going to explain about the basics of machine learning, a little bit of background for people that they, they just heard the name or they have some conception about the name. And then uh, Francisco is going to present one of the examples that how we can use it for process control. <coughs> and at the end, I'm going to come back again and explain briefly about our approach in APCO, uh, how we want to use machine learning and what are the projects that we are having. So hopefully you will find it useful and interesting. So I'll pass it to Thank you very much. Thanks, Mason. I'm going to put this mic down and um, yell if you can't hear me. I'll turn it off. So much for the off button. All right. So just a quick um, intro for those of you who saw beforehand and wondering what on earth you were looking at. Uh, that's a neural network which I've just downloaded off the internet. It's been trained in object detection. So what's happened is out there, and I'll talk more about it later, there's big data sets which people have labeled saying, this is a cup, this is a person, this is a keyboard. Someone's taken all those data sets, put it into a pretty advanced neural network, trained it over quite a long time, so probably days or months, depending on the amount of computer power available. Um, and that then learns what these objects are, and we can then pretty much download that and run it. So that was running off my phone as a webcam and my laptop doing the actual analysis. But the analysis is often a lot quicker than the training. I will run it again at the end if you want to try and trick it, because as you would have seen, it doesn't get everything right always. But a bit of um, context. So Pancho went and gave us a quick Google Trends. You go to Google Trends, it's quite fun. Uh, just type in stuff and it tells you what's happening. So we looked at artificial intelligence, big data, data science, machine learning, and uh, minerals processing. Uh, so this is the last 15 years. <laughs> we can see, unfortunately, that um, minerals processing are not so hot. Um, yeah. Interesting to see artificial intelligence was big, died down a lot, coming up again, along with big data, data science, machine learning. So not surprisingly, these are all the buzzwords. But what is obvious about that um, trend which we're seeing over there is that the end of the world is coming. Um, well, maybe not. What's also interesting, just as a side, is if you look at that map over here, different countries, regional places, the different keywords come up. And that's something we're going to be talking a bit about today, specifically in the beginning, is really just trying to give you an overview of what do all these buzzwords mean, what's important, what's maybe not so important, uh, because it is one of those things where there's a, a lot being said at the moment. So I've got a few of different slides which look like this, which give these nice different sort of Venn diagram type approaches. And I say, so a lot of this is um, keywords, so hopefully 
Um, you know, what AI, artificial intelligence, that's the buzzword. That's probably the main buzzword at the moment to get you into the room. Uh, if you actually speak to the people who are doing this stuff, no one likes the word artificial intelligence because it doesn't accurately enough sort of dis or describe what they're actually doing. Um, I guess, you know, most people realize once you delve into something that you're doing something very specific and you appreciate that there's lots of other areas. So AI is just this big umbrella term. What does it mean? And I've got a few more um, slides, which again, different people have different opinions. There's no real consensus. So in a way, you could just happily ignore it, I would say. Um, so here, some of the buzzwords up here, actionable insights, that's a great business term. What does it mean? It just means let's make a decision to do something. No point going and doing a whole lot of data analysis, machine learning, whatever, desktop study, doing something in Excel. If you can't, at the end of the day, say, yeah, are we are going to build this? No, we're not going to build this or make a decision. Well, that was probably pointless. Um, maybe some of them disagree with that, but I think most people would agree. Analytics. You've all been doing analytics for ages. That's the good news, you know. Be it in your spreadsheet, Excel spreadsheet, or you know, just drawing a graph by hand. Arguably, that's all analytics. All that's really happening to me with these things is it's just the scale. As we get big data, just lots of data, it gets a bit more difficult to do what we've always been doing, and so there's tools which help us along the way. So I guess to me, that's my message in this talk. It's I see it as more of the same, but we're just using computers to help us, and there's a lot of different tools which can help us. Sometimes they'll hinder us, just like they have done in the past. Um, so yeah, cognitive's an interesting one, I guess, in that in the beginning, specifically with things like neural networks, a lot of scientists thought, well, if we want to make something which is intelligent and artificial, well, we're going to need to mimic the, what the human does. So they went and looked at the brain, and that was sort of the inspiration behind the neural networks. People were trying to really um, you know, imitate exactly what goes on inside. So that's the cognitive side of things. Machine learning, so that's what I would say people traditionally in the field would have well, is the term they would use. It's still a very large umbrella term. It means lots of things, but if you're speaking to the experts, they'll be choosing machine learning over AI more generally. As I say, it's got a lot of subsets, and I'll show you some of those. Deep learning is one of, again, the newer fads. It just refers to the traditional neural networks had a certain level of complexity and layers. Now the newer ones have just ridiculous depth in terms of numbers of data and numbers of layers they go through. <coughs> so again, that's just a subset. All right, so as I said, I'll be showing you a few more different Venn diagrams. So my point with this is, you know, not that any one of them is the answer. It's just to show different things overlap. And I mean, none of them are right. Business intelligence, they, what was I think? I looked at civic. They don't use statistics, apparently. You know? Of course not. So you can try and draw these nice little pictures, but it doesn't make sense. But, it's, um, but it gives, again, an idea, you know, business, yeah, big data. I mean, everything spans everything else, and sometimes they intersect. But if we go to the definitions, I'm not going to read out all of these definitions. Um, I think you can read them yourselves, but you'll very quickly get the flavor of, of the idea. It's about computers trying to mimic, you know, people doing intelligent things. As I said, it's a bit of an academic exercise of, to me, of defining what artificial intelligence is. Um, we should really just, you know, get on with doing things, really. Mm. All right. So another one, I quite like this diagram on the left. So it's got machine learning split into deep supervised and unsupervising. Natural language processing is an interesting area. So text and speech, unstructured data. How does that all fit together? But again, different people are going to have arguments about where it fits. I would have put image recognition and machine vision as a subset of machine learning. That's the way I see it. Other people might think. Similarly, speech recognition, text to speech, all of those things, those fit under machine learning. One can argue that robotics, I mean, maybe the actual part of you know the control system and how the robot moves left and right, that might not be machine learning. But as soon as we're training it to do something, that could also fit into machine learning. So again, it's just there's lots of different things, and they all sort of fit under a myriad of different um, <coughs> umbrellas. Kind of like mineral processing, you know. There's lots of things under that, and then you can say, oh, well, it's just you know mining, comminution, and flotation. And then someone will be like, well, what about this? And then, oh, well, if we, we don't want to look at each of them in isolation. We've got to look at the bigger picture. And so there's a lot of that, and I think it's not 
So it's not really specific to the artificial intelligence or machine learning world. I think it's true of everything, really. It's, you know, as we sort of solve some of the more basic problems, we need to look bigger and further, and it starts to become a bit more multidisciplinary. And you know, there's lots of things you need to ideally take care of, but no one's going to know them all. So don't look at this thing and say, oh, I'm going to ask Gordon about everything in that Venn diagram, because that's certainly not my message. I'm not an expert on the majority of those things. I've got experience in some of them, more in others, but you know, there's always more to learn. So that's my message there, I think. So, what, um, you know, why are we actually interested in this in sort of mining minerals processing um, context? As I sort of said before, to me, I look at this all just as a continuum. Uh, we've had things, you know, in the good old days, it was nice and easy, and you know, you could go and pick up your lump of metal off the ground. Admittedly, that was quite a few years ago and probably before our time. But, you know, things got more difficult. We needed more advanced tools. And things keep continuing. So, you know, the limited resources of complex ore bodies, you know, volatility, social demands, all of this, largely coupled with we now have a lot of data. And, uh, you know, data is, you know, again, everyone here deals with data. Or at least I'm pretty sure everyone here has dealt with data. Again, it's, it's just that extension of it's simple-ish when you've got a spreadsheet with a few columns and a few rows. It's more difficult when you've got one with 10,000 columns and a billion rows. When you've got you know, more and more and more, you just need more tools to help you work through that. And so uh, we can start using these tools to help us solve these problems. So again, in a way, minerals processing and the application of these tools is no different for many other industries. Obviously, they're going to be specific areas of focus. Um, and, you know, we've mentioned a few of those, and Mohsen's going to go into a bit more detail of those a bit later. But um, I guess a good point at the bottom as well, which really comes back to the uh, actionable insights um, comment, real-time data and actually being able to make that decision. It's, you know, while it can be useful to go back and say, oh, if only we had known X, unless you can translate that into, well, in future I'm going to design Y, or you know, put it into some kind of real-time control system where you're actually doing something, it all is also a bit academic and possibly pointless. Um, so some more um, buzzwords on the right for you. Um, again, these are just some of the examples of where these technologies are being used in the minerals processing. So you know, a lot of autonomous equipment, image processing. Say so I've worked on cloth. Im imaging, um, ore sorting, you know, measuring particle size from camera feeds, uh, predictor maintenance, advanced control, health and safety. Or really, I guess the point here is most areas could probably use this kind of analysis. Uh, so coming back to sort of some ideas, so I like this picture on the right, the data deluge. There's also um, what's termed and been around for a while, the curse of dimensionality, which again is that one-dimensional data, you know, nice and easy to work with, two-dimensional, fine, three-dimensional. Most people are still okay with because they can visualize it, and after that, it all just goes downhill very rapidly. Um, again, I was thinking, well, how do I, you know, give a nice demonstration of four-dimensional data, or for that matter, 20-dimensional data? And it's just very difficult to sort of explain and get that across. And as I say, we've got all these new sensors, everything's getting monitored, you know, I mean, just the fact that you can go onto Google and type in any keyword and you can see every single hit for the last, you know, it's just massive. So how do we deal with all of that? Um, but I'll go back to one of my points at the top, which I'm going to emphasize again and again. To me, this, all of this stuff, it's just a tool in, the tool in our toolbox. And there's lots of different machine learning tools, even machine learning. It's not, you know, oh, here's the answer. Some people will come and say, this is the panacea. It's going to solve all your problems. Not a chance. It's going to solve specific problems very well, like any other tool will solve specific problems very well. And like other tools, if you use them badly, they can maybe get you some of the way there. They might even solve a problem. And if you use it wrong, you'll wreck things horribly. So that's um, the way. And so I've put in some points there about you know, understanding. You go and do something blindly, you know, I can go and fiddle with my car and I can put a spanner in somewhere and maybe I'll fix the problem and if I'm unlucky I'll break it and I won't necessarily have any understanding of it. So sometimes that can work but if you understand things obviously it works better. So where we see it is 
uh, the sort of hybrid approach of using these tools, but you know, we need that expertise which people have to really direct us in terms of where we're focusing and a lot of sort of iteration really of trying things, seeing how it works and understanding and going back and forth in that way. Um, so that's that one. So here's another, so again, that's the simple linear regression model which most of you are probably familiar with. You know, this one at the bottom, that's a much more you know, state-of-the-art convolutional neural network. That's the architecture of the neural network, well, roughly speaking, which was being run at the beginning. Um, and in each of these little, you know, things that that's an image. So one image here, you know, 640 by 480 for a low <coughs> image, three channels for RGB. So that's already, you know, a couple of million data points for one picture. You know, and that flows into one tiny little thing over here. So it's just it's ridiculous the amounts of data which gets used. But on the flip side, the computing power available to us is also truly staggering these days. So it enables us to deal with that. So these are just some differences, by no means an exhaustive list, but to kind of show you the difference between, I guess, a traditional model-based approach and the so-called data-based. Um, just um, yeah, so they both got strengths, they both got weaknesses, um, like all things. Um, the big difference is, you know, for the traditional model based, you want to be, un you need to understand what's going on. The, I guess, allure of the data um, driven approach is that, oh, I don't need to know anything about this process. I can just shove it all in, press the button, get the answer, and away I go. You're not going to get great results by doing that. You know, you'll get crazy results, and I'll show you some examples um, a bit later. And I would argue, though, that it's exactly the same as us taking that linear regression and just applying that linear regression with no understanding of the system. It's doing it. so. It's the continuum. Um, so again, if we know about structure and we know about our things and we want to, you know, able to interpret things a bit better, the model based approach is great uh, and does a lot, but it requires deep domain knowledge and understanding. And so on the data driven approach, we don't need that. Um, but as I say, interpretation, uh, predictability, when things work outside of bounds are still a bit of a risk. So when does it all go wrong? So I'm, as you'll see, this is what I alluded to before. I'll give you a time look at So the number of worldwide non-commercial space launches versus the sociology <laughs> doctorates awarded in the United States. So this is nothing to do with machine learning, but as I say, on the continuum, that's a correlation. It's great. So we can go and you know, predict, and we can invest our money based on the number of sociology doctors being awarded. So if we look at the intake of you know, the beginning of the year of how many people are four years ago, we'll know four years in the future, how many non-commercial space launches there'll be, and we can make millions, right? It's obvious. Well, maybe it's not. Um, so you don't need machine learning to come up with that. So it's, it's the same problems again and again. This one's a little bit more depressing. <laughs> and this is an interesting one because of the the fact that they even have <laughs> data on such things. <laughs> so, as I say, th those aren't specific um, to um, machine learning. Here are some examples of where it does all go wrong from a machine learning. So Netflix, in case you don't know, is watching your every move. When you, they're internally running experiments on you, which you don't necessarily realize. So the screen I see on Netflix will be different for yours. They're catering it according to what they think is important to you. So for things like um, movies, if they think Gordon loves horror movies, they'll show the thumbnails which are horror, even if the movie is actually a romantic comedy. Whereas if they think Pancho loves romantic comedies, they'll show him a happy picture to make it not look so scary, even though it is a horror movie. And they'll be moving stuff around and testing all the time. This is one of the ones where they you know, got themselves into a fair bit of trouble because essentially they were you know, effectively racial profiling, even though that wasn't specifically their intention, but what happened was movies which had very few black cast members who only appeared for, I believe it was, you know, a couple of minutes in the 
movie and really didn't have a big part at all, they ended up being shown as the thumbnails to black customers. And so, not surprisingly, people got upset about this and Netflix got a lot of black for it. Um, I've also got another example closer to home. Good evening. Welcome to this the Sunday 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 on the phone two nights morning. ago. Please tell me your customer access number. If you have one, you may know this is your customer reference number. Three, two, four, six, seven, eight, zero, five, eight, V. You know Sorry, please tell me your customer access number, including the letter at the end. Or say, I don't have one. Three, two, four, six, seven, eight, zero, five, eight, V. Sorry, I still didn't understand. If you are not sure what to do, say, more information. Otherwise, tell me your customer access number, including the letter on the end. Three, two, four, six, seven, eight, zero, five, eight, V. All right. So, this is the one where I was remaining calm and not getting grumpy. Um, I, I think it's great we all have your sentiment. No, I am aware of that, and so that's not my sentiment. Not that I'm really glad to know. Um, but, yes. So, and again, so I guess one of my points with this is when things go wrong, but things have gone wrong before, and they'll continue to go wrong in the future. So, I think for anything, and again, it's not machine learning really specific. You need to look at the consequences. You know, is it, oh, Gordon's got grumpy on the line and starts yelling at the phone and eventually gets to an operator who guess what their first thing is? Can I please have your Centrelink <laughs> reference number? But at least they understand it. Or is it, you know, oh, we broke the sag mill versus, oh, tons are running slightly lower through the plant than, you know, we're hoping for. So it's all about getting that risk and sort of like potential reward right. I mean, if you're doing this stuff and people's lives are at stake, that's you know a crazy different business compared to you know things where it's not that important. And so getting that risk profile right is key. And again, I'm not going to go into it all now, but there's there's differences between the false positive rates and the false negative rates. So you know, it's sort of that. Well, if someone's really sick and we miss them, is that worse than telling ten people they've got cancer when they don't? Um, so I started, I'm just going to go through a few of the technologies, cautious of time, so I'm going to speed up a bit, um, but I'm going to start with a little bit on data analytics. So as I said, you've all done data analytics, that's the good news, so you can write that on your CV. Um, so inspired by the um, mineral processing not working so well, I decided to throw in comminution and flotation. And it's great news for everyone who's in flotation. Flotation wins hands down. I've done the analytics across the USA. Everyone's interested in flotation. Only seem to be doing um, comminution in a few small key states. So that's where you want to go invest your money in if you're in comminution. Um, and as I said, like all things, it depends where you stop and if you do some interpretation. <coughs> so I did a bit more digging. What are the Americans really interested in? They want to know how to use their genes as a flotation device. <laughs> Why? I am not quite sure. Especially the ones who are all in the middle of America and not at the sea. Um, so again, this is a message for all of this stuff. Context, knowledge, delving deeper. But again, it's the same stuff we've all been doing again and again. We come up with a model, we need to check it, we need to look at the extremes, we need to investigate further. So that's just the brief introduction to data analytics. At some point, again, it's murky data analytics turns into machine learning. Uh, we've got three main um, areas which we're choosing sort of to present about today. Not, again, not necessarily the be all and end all. So supervised learning, that's where you know the answers already for some cases and you say, you pretty much show them to someone and say, when this happens, I know this happens. Go figure out why. Unsupervised learning is, I've got a lot of stuff and I don't know the answers. What can you magically tell me from all of this data? And reinforcement learning is what Pancho is going to talk about. So that's about you know, sequences of actions. So as I mentioned briefly, supervised learning. So what this needs is labeled data sets. It doesn't work without it and it needs lots of data and it needs to be labeled and it needs to be labeled well and it needs to be broad and wide. If you don't have 
broad and wide label data sets, then everything only works for the regime where you got your data. Much the same as anything else, actually. If you go and you know, do some test work on a plant and you only look at a very narrow range of operating conditions and you come up with your model and you come along you know, a week, a month, whenever later, and it's running a different ore or you know, they've changed the configuration, guess what? Your model doesn't work well. Same here. So what's a lot of these data sets are quite old. You can see there's things I mean, ooh, I'm go back. I mean, I, if you remember the good old days of the internet, you don't see it so much now. You had to have the capture where they asked you to show you a little picture, got you to type in words to verify that you weren't some malicious person. That was actually a two-phase thing. They were actually creating these data sets as well as verification. So that's how a lot of sort of the handwriting and text recognition stuff got effectively crowdsourced, but without people knowing it. Um, today, there's crowdsourced all these. Well, not all of them, but a lot of these data sets are crowdsourced. They just put it up and say, here is data, go label it for fun. Some people pay other people to la label data, but some people think it's fun to just go, and, oh, here's, yeah, I'll mark off. There's a car, you know, there's a pedestrian, all those things. And if you go and look at those data sets, they're not perfect. I've gone and looked at some previously, and it's like, wow, oh, someone's saying that's a carrot, and you're like, no, that's an orange. Um, so people get things wrong. It's all. Yeah, difficult. But the key is with this, you need that information to train things. And so this picture, uh, just Pancho put it together before I went and did the demo. I'm not going to hang on, but this is really that same thing of how we can um, train all these different neural networks. Again, like all things, there's maybe not so much in uh, minerals processing where you've got maybe one or two models for a mill and you know, people know this one works well in this conditions and this one works well in that condition because this area has a lot of research by a lot of people. There's effectively big competitions where just pretty much who can get which data set recognized the most or the best or whatever value of um, accuracy using their neural network. And so you get millions of different sort of architectures of neural networks and, you know, oh, I got 93% for this thing. Oh, my new one got 94%. In a way, I think it's largely academic. Um, again, if for some reason you need, you know, 99.3% over 99.2%, then it's worth going, you know, and figuring out exactly, you know, what it is the absolute best. But <coughs> a lot for sort of that engineering approach, things which are good enough are probably comparable. So this is unsupervised learning, which is a demonstration on the right. This is k-means clustering using three um, clusters. So what happens is when you have data, uh, and again, this is 2D data, so everything which you see here is best done in multi-dimensional data. We can't see it, and you couldn't just draw a picture around it, but because it's hard to um, visualize, it's easier for doing it in lower dimensions for people. So you can see as this is iterating through, oh, let's go back to the beginning now, it starts off and it's finding clumps of data. Now all of that it does here is it, this is actually a really simple algorithm, but it's proven to work pretty well. You randomly allocate centers, which are those X's, which are a little bit dark, hard to see. And then you reassign everything to the closest center. And then you move the center to the middle of the cluster and you just iterate through this. So it work, works pretty well for certain data sets, if there actually is in fact, you know, clusters. If there's not clusters, guess what? It's not gonna magically you know, make them out of nowhere. And the big difficulty with it also is getting the right number of clusters. Um, you've got to guess that. Um, this is another one. So, okay, there's more things. I'm not going to go through this hierarchical clustering, self-organizing maps, um, neural networks, um, support vector machines. What I've actually got at the bottom is just a demonstration of a um, Gaussian mixture model. So, if you quick, so. This is actually a supervised learning case. I know I've got a blue class and I've got a red class and they mostly overlap. So when I get a new one, it's obvious to us as a person, put a new dot over there, it's obviously blue, right? We can see that sort of straight away. One over there, yeah, that's going to be red. Now, if you're using a K nearest neighbor classifier, you need to go and then analyze and say, well, let, I have to compare that new dot with every single dot in my data set find out which is it's closest to, and that's going to be the new class. So as you get lots and lots and lots and lots of data, that 
processing becomes time consuming. And so this is also one of the trade-offs is there's the complexity of your learning and then there's the complexity of actually applying the system because if you have an answer but it took you three years to get there, that's not very good. So a lot of these tools are also, well, we're willing to sacrifice a bit of accuracy but we'll make things run fast. And so this is being, if you take that data, you can represent it as, so this is um, Gaussian kernel. So just your bell curve but in two or three dimensions. We add one centered at the blue dot with variance in the x and y directions, which are quite wide. And over there, and this red one has got two. It's probably quite difficult to see over here. You can see those two bumps. It's a shallow one over there, a slightly bigger one. And these two red ones sit most on top. So when you've got this, all of that data is now defined by one, two, three, four, multiplied by two. So 16 parameters. So the maths to solve is just a lot quicker. So that's the kind of thing. Um, okay, this is still you know, fairly basic stuff, and again, more complexity gets built up. But. And then I was doing this. So this is just an example um, of some of the work we're doing at the moment. It's by no means complete because we've just started, but we thought it'd be worth giving a bit of an overview of well, what do we actually do when we do this stuff. So we're trying to um, detect orbital mill overloading. And so, first step is actually, so we're trying to get, um, use combination of the PI data. So step one is to obtain that PI data from the, the client. Um, and then you invariably go through this cleaning d data stage where you want to organize, often referred to as data wrangling. Now that's actually, or often, where you end up doing the most of your work. We'd like to think it shouldn't be. Um, but anyone who's actually played in this space, uh, in a variety of projects of all different spheres, it's always where you struggle the most. Um, but invariably when you, and so this is by no means what I'm saying, sort of reflecting on our current project and client, but um, when you ask people for data, normally you get nothing, you get nothing, you get nothing, and then some, you know, you get grumpy, you send them an email saying, where is the data? And they're just like, I'll give you the data, and they bring out, boom, there's the data. And now you've got data. What on earth is in this data? And you laugh because you've all been through it, I'm sure. And so you then start to look and like, okay, I've got tags. So we've got data. It's got a whole lot of tags. CFB, 239, 71FOX, CB. What on earth is that? You know, I don't know. No. Good, good, good news is I've got a description on it. Hooray, bad news is it's in Spanish, so I don't understand it. You know, off to Pancho, Pancho, what does this mean? You know? Does it have units? Does, oh, it doesn't have units, you know. Oh, I can look at the range, you know. Oh, this one's mostly between 0 and 100, but sometimes it's sitting at 3 million, you know. <laughs> sometimes it's got arbitrary text in there saying it doesn't work. So there's a lot of pain and suffering dealing with this. That's for data which has been given to you by a computer system like a Pi data. That's great. Don't give me data which has been generated by people. They're the worst. Because they don't follow instructions, they don't follow standards. So as a side, I was had a little bit of work with um, some of the tailings review stuff with Eleanor from also from SMI, and so she had latitude and longitude data which had been submitted by mines of where their tailing stands are. Simple. I've got all of this. I can just plot it on a map. Oh no, I'm using degrees with decimal degrees. No, I'm using minutes, seconds. Sometimes I'll use single inverted comma for you know minutes. Sometimes I'll write minutes someone else. You know how many different inverted commas there are on a keyboard around the world? <laughs> I've got an idea. There's lots. <laughs> so just to convert all of that data into something consistent and usable, it's time consuming and painful and tedious. But if you don't get that step right, everything else falls over. So. And a lot of this is iterative, because you do this, you think you've done something, you try something. So, so this is my sort of general workflow. So we get all that data, we clean it up, let's visualize, plot some graphs and do some sanity checks. Go to the experts who actually know and say, you know, I looked at your data and I saw this. Is that what you expect to see? Because they might look at it and say, what on earth is that? And if you've done any more work, you've wasted your time entirely. So, do that. Um, I've got your facet data, same thing. We, you can look at all the data together, but there's lots of variables. So what if I look at it by month, by this, by that, by condition A, condition B? Again, it's not necessarily difficult, complex things, but you've got to divide it up and look at it. It helps you build your understanding, and you can confirm with the experts that things 
are going on. So for us, we're going to then you know, apply the power model. So Marco has given me his power model. Great, you know, and I've got to hook it up and shove some data in. And then it'll be, oh wait, I need that data. I didn't have that data. Let me go ask for that data. Did I get it? Let me clean it, iterate, all of that. And with that, when I run it, I'm going to have more data. Um, then we've got ground truth data. I want ground truth data for this, again, because it makes life easier. Am I going to get it? I don't know. You know, what form is this going to be? We're talking about, you know, does control log, do I have to scan control logs to get it? Can I speak to people? Can I get their, you know, ideas on things? And there's another important case there. You've got the data, that, which is allegedly ground truth. Um, is it ground truth? I don't know. I'm going to shut up though, because I'm going to run out of time. Um, I like this stuff. But then, yeah, so then we'll do some cluster infrastructure state identification, again, sanity checks, um, look for similar things. All right. Thank you, Gordon. So, so far we have seen, so Gordon, thank you. You showed us uh, different approaches. One is uh, supervised, where we need basically ground truth data, labeled data. Unsupervised, where basically we have just tons of data and we try to sort of cluster it together in some different groups. Uh, reinforced, reinforced Reinforcement learning is a different approach that deals with the dynamics of the system. It's the best way to do, is it, it tries to find a sequence of actions. So for me, that sounds like control. It's basically involves um, a system, an environment, involves the dynamics, involves actions. Uh, and why it's important and why this reinforcement learning basically got traction, uh, it's because in 2015, DeepMind uh, AlphaGo beat the best Go player in the world, and that was basically thought to be impossible because of all the options that are available in the game, it's so complex and everything. And it turns out that, yes, I think yesterday or the day before, DeepMind now beat the, is beating the best players in StarCraft, which is also even more complex than uh, AlphaGo. All right, so what is uh, reinforcement, reinforcement learning? So the idea here is that we have an environment, so our system that has some dynamics, and we have an agent. This agent is the AI, the machine learning, the neural networks. And this uh, agent takes actions onto the environment and observes the environment's reaction, but also gets a reward. So we need to sort of define what's the best action in order, uh, given the observations based on that reward. So the key elements here are the agent, the environment, and the reward. So the idea is to train the agent in to develop the best sequence of actions to get the most reward in the long term. There are different architectures that we can use most used one is uh, called actor critic, which basically means that we will have two ne neural networks. One is called the actor, that basically just relates the observations with the actions. So it's given an observation, it will give you an action. But then you have a second, uh, a second neural network that will take the reward for the given action and calculate like what's the best long-term policy. So it will sort of inform this actor on that action, what is going to be the long-term. So here we have two neural networks learning in conjunction. Um, I'm going to show you an, an example, but basically the, the important thing here is, as in many things, as for example Gordon said, when we have a clustering, we need to define the number of clusters. How do we know the number of clusters? Well, sometimes it's trial and error. Here we also need to define some parameters. One of them is how many layers. So how big is the, network ne the neural network? How many layers here as well? And more, is, more importantly is how do we define the reward? Because if the reward is basically ill-defined, then the system is not going to learn. It's sort of I guess similar to teaching a child, that if you just don't reward the, the correct sequence, then the children just, they're not going to learn. So that is critical. And now I'm going to show you uh, a few examples. So 
imagine that we want to teach this AI system, this actor critic, to make a robot walk. So we have a robot that is basically consists of these two legs plus a body that's where the center of mass. And we want, we want this to actually learn and teach the robot to walk without any knowledge about the system. The only thing that the uh, AI knows is the observations. So it's basically the position, the velocity, the rotation, the joint angles and the rates, and the contact forces. So all the variables basically are labeled here. So it's a fairly complex system. As you can see, we have 6, 12, 24, 26, 26 variables. And the actions are all the torques that we exert onto the motors. Now, we, what we want is to basically try to teach the system through our reward on how to make the robot work. So first attempt, we say, just go as fast as you can. So our reward is basically um, just the velocity. We want, we want it, in this case, just to walk in a, on a straight line. So just go as fast as you want. Solution, drop there. Then there is some velocity, and you try to maximize it, so just drop into it, drop, drop there. So now, the thing here is, with this reward, the system might eventually learn how to walk. Because you, you can imagine that walking is actually, you get more velocity than just dropping there. But it will take time, and it will become even probably impossible. So let's try to fix this. And now say, go as fast as you can, and try to maximize the simulation time. So basically, what is happening here is that the system learns until the, the robot uh, fails, basically. So uh, the robot falls, then the system ends, and it knows that basically it needs to try again and try again. So what we're doing here is basically saying, Go as fast as you can, and for every time step, I will give you a bit of a reward. So I will try to stay active uh, for more time. So the solution, just instead of dropping dead, just jump <laughs> forward. <laughs> so you can see that this is also sort of on the, the same lines that Gordon was mentioning, like where things can go wrong. OK, let's try to fix this. Now. Go as fast as you can, try to stay basically sort of uh, active, and let's try to maintain the body at a certain height so it doesn't try to just drop. So what happens, it then sort of starts walking, <laughs> it sort of goes forward, it's sort of doing some zombie-like walking, <laughs> sort of, I guess, topical for Halloween. Um, but some people might say, that's actually quite quite good, but obviously it's not what we, we intended. We, we wanted to actually walk on the straight line following that reference. So because we wanted to walk on this uh, straight line, and, and we see that it was like doing some jumping stuff, we, we will add this term, which is pretty common in control, which is basically try to minimize the action, like the, the actuator effort. And what happens, now it's looking good. See, now it's actually, you can say it's working. Problem is, as you can see, that it starts deviating from the reference. So, sort of, in this case, it's going this way, but it might not also go that way. And we want it to walk on a straight line. So we fix that easily, but just say, stay closer to this line. And now, we have our walking rope. Now, the important thing here is that this is all based in simulation. So if we actually then take this uh, trained AI system and put it onto an actual robot, things might not go as nice as here. And we don't know actually what's going to happen. Good thing is the training can continue whilst you are actually running the system. So it can learn continuously. So you can take this solution put it into an actual robot, and then make it learn as it goes with the new <coughs> system. Sort of in the way that people learn how to use, uh, I don't know, their feet to write because they, they, they don't have uh, hands anymore. Your, your flexibility is on this learning process. So currently, what I'm trying to 
to achieve is to use this control approach with uh, controlling a sag mill that is in a closed loop with a pebbles crush. So we have a simulation system here. This is all done in MATLAB simulating. And then we take the observations, we calculate the reward, and here is the agent that takes the actions into the system. So the same structure as before. Um, you can see the actions are that let's change the feed rate, the speed of the rotation of the meal, and the water addition. The observations are the filling of the of, of the sand, the PA of the product, power, and the throughput. And the reward is sort of similar to what an MPC would look like. You try to maximize the throughput, minimize the energy, but keep the PAV in a certain range. Now this is working in inverted commas, in the sense that it is actually running, it is actually learning, it is worth it, but I need to continue checking on the solution because AI is very cheeky. It, it cheats a lot, basically. So we have seen many examples, uh, I have them here, but of uh, AI reinforcement learning that you teach it how to play a game and it can actually learn how to cheat on the game. <laughs> Because it's anything is easy, you just you just want to win. More reward, there is no ethics. So it might be <laughs> it might be cheating, so I need to check. So how do we actually compare this, as I said, with an uh, model based informed control system or an ML uh, MPC, model based control? <coughs> the underlying goal in reinforcement learning is is a is a simple goal, you want to win, you want to maximize the reward. No problem on how to sort of actually do it. Here, on when we use MPC, we actually have a system, we have a model behind. At first, sometimes it's even a uh, persuasive one. So the dynamics is actually controlled by the model. This is a trick, an important one, stability. There is no way we can ensure stability with uh, these uh, sort of systems, like uh, reinforced reinforce leg or uh, any sort of AI where basically everything is just, is a black box which you just know that if you input this you will get this <coughs> output but you cannot ensure that the output is going to be for example restrained to a certain domain so stability we cannot ensure anything and the same for state constraints we cannot enforce constraints we can sort of try to teach them so if we include those in the reward or in the system maybe the system will learn but also again we don't know. As I s we saw in the videos, failure is important. We, we need, the, the AI needs to fail, needs to learn on, on failure. When you install a controller on, on, on a plant, you, you, failure is not acceptable. So we think that actually the, 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 the best uh, alternative here is sort of same as Gordon said, is as hybrid. You can use AI as the expert that is on top sitting on 70 set points for the different controllers. And the different controllers actually will ensure stability and the constraints. But then AI can actually work on how to maximize the global throughput. For example, in cases where you have competing NPC. So you have an NPC controlling the SAC and you have another NPC controlling the ball uh, cyclone circuit. Those two are competing. So if the SAC actually maximizes the throughput and just sends more stuff to the ball meet, it will just put pressure on the second circuit. That will need to then sort of deal with that. But if we have someone on top regulating uh, both cases, then we can probably achieve a uh, better solution. So I'll hand over to Mosa now. So I'll try to be quick because yeah. I'm pretty sure there will be lots of discussion. So I think uh, just this few last slides is kind of a summary of what we try to achieve. I'm hoping that actually from the slide that uh, Gordon presented and Pancho, you can see the way that we think about machine learning and AI and how we can use it in your processing, especially around process control and prediction. So this is slide I've presented in many occasions, so people from JK probably they see it many times, but that's essentially our grand vision in terms of how we want to enable or uh, cover the gaps that exist in, uh, in our capability to be able to enable such a vision that actually we can use our integrated modeling capability link with the data that is available from the mining and geology and using the data that is generated by plant to be able to predict 
the future of the processing plant. So that's, that's basically our grand vision. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I uh, always express uh, this point that actually we are not going to build this platform or we are not going to deliver anything uh, to compete with people that they have different platforms outside. The old vision is if you want to enable such a uh, capability, what are the gaps? What are the research gaps? And then we try to focus on those ones. And today you saw lots of uh, information around machine learning and AI and we think that we, we can use that hybrid application in here to benefit from the data that is generated from the processing plant, link it with our modeling capability, and use that to uh, basically use the machine learning to inform our models in terms of the calibration factors and how we can use uh, those data. So as part of that, actually, we have been working in uh, the idea of using the PI data, and, and uh, Gordon mentioned about the volume overloading uh, world to use that uh, data, use the machine learning and power of AR to cluster the data to different operating regimes and then understand that different operating regime actually correlates with uh, calibration state of each of these mathematical models that we, we have a uh, good one of them in JK. So, and then use uh, the help of AR to identify at each point of the time what type of calibration factor I have to use in my integrated simulation and it helps us to have a better predictability in our models because we know when you're running a real-time plant, always the state of operation of the equipment is changing. And we need to swap between different calibration factors. So one calibration factor might not be uh, giving us a good prediction. And we believe that actually AI can help us to real-time, get the PI data, understand the status of or operating regime of the, each of the equipment, and then we can decide what calibration factor we have to use in our integrated modeling, and then use it for prediction. So we start a couple of projects now I'm working in this space, and I'm hoping that actually, maybe in a year time, we can present some of the outputs to you guys and see how, how that work works. Uh, and, and one thing that is the last one I wanted to explain, it's important, and, and Gordon mentioned as well, uh, don't forget about unstructured data. There are lots of information exists in operating plans uh, as production data, uh, uh, ship reports, maintenance reports, and also <coughs> lots of reports that generated the process optimization. So this is a specific uh, uh, project that actually we are working with Endelion, uh, which is basically run by one of the JK alumni as well, and team knows very well, uh, still run as well. Uh, uh, and um, this is very important, and we, I think uh, for the interest of time, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but there would be a very powerful approach if we combine the AI which uses the structured data and AI that uses some structured data because there are heaps of information that actually exist in written format that we are not leveraging much. And the last one uh, is kind of a summary. So I think the message is uh, often people they think that AI is a magic tool, it's not a magic tool. So it's one tool that you can use it, you have to understand where is the best use of that, uh, that tool. Uh, don't forget the domain expertise. So I often hear people that say, oh, give us the data and then we give you the output, but you need the domain expertise. And uh, I think in uh, slides today we show a couple of examples that actually teams go wrong uh, if you uh, tend to forget about the domain expertise. And then in terms of potential benefits, I think we strongly believe, and I think it's not us, there are lots of people that they think hybrid approach is best, using the knowledge base capability linked into the AI, but just you have to understand how you can uh, split the responsibility between these two tools. And I think machine learning has a good uh, capability to use the data in the best way, which normally our model uh, based, they, they don't uh, have that capability. And I think that's the key point to, to merge these two together. And, and I think the last one is don't forget the unstructured data as well. So I think we are not doing much, at least at JK, so we are hoping that actually we initiate more work on that one as well and look into the unstructured data as well. Thank you very much. I think it was a long uh, talk, but uh, if there's any discussion, I would like to invite Gordon and Pancho to join me. If you have enough time. To